Thank you, worship team, for leading us in praise to our King and singing the gospel. What a blessing. Thank you guys so much. You may be seated. And um, if you came in from this direction over here, you probably noticed the Nebraska Family Alliance and voter registration table out in the lobby. And maybe that stirred some feelings in you. There are some in here that see that and they say, yes, I'm so excited to have a conversation in church about politics. Woohoo! And there are some of you in here that are like, oh, I'm so uncomfortable to have a conversation about politics. Ugh. And there are some of you in here that have like, I've never thought about having a conversation <laughs> about politics. You've never even given it a thought before. So, we need to address the elephant in the room. And I'm not talking about the Republicans. I'm talking about, you see what, it, you see what I did that there? Because elephant and donkey. Anyway, we need to address this issue. Because politics can be just as divisive and difficult out there as it can be in here. This, this is an out there and an in here situation that we need to look at here among our church, among God's faith family. But it shouldn't have to be difficult or divisive. We shouldn't have to have this weird churning issue in it when we're talking about this in church. Because regardless of how we think about how it should be handled in here, the reality remains. There are big, difficult issues coming at us as Christians this election on November 5th. I think we all know that. We all know it's a big thing. And the elders and I believe that just because something is a hot button issue or controversial, it should not be ignored. We should be a church that is, that is able to say these are difficult things, but we can be mature and we can seek the word of the Lord and see how we should be able to walk in these things rather than just saying, let's avoid them. So the elders have asked me to, to take this task on for the next three weeks. So for the next three weeks, I'm going to preach two sermons um, well, I'm doing two, and then Tim will do one. But I'm going to preach a little mini sermon each week for the next three weeks to, to lead us into the Word of God. And each week, I'm going to be addressing one question. This first week, the question is this. What does the Bible say about voting? Pretty reasonable question. Next week, what does the Bible say about ballot initiatives? And then finally, what does the Bible say about selecting government leaders? These are big questions. The Bible, I think, does speak to these things. And so that's what we're going to, to dig into. So the first one today, what does the Bible say about voting? Now, we could go to lots of places in the Bible, but I think the place that the best helps us to get our mind around this and to think about it well is Matthew 22. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 22. So if you want to go there, I want to encourage that you do that. I'm going to I'm going to read this, and then we're going to talk about it. I think first we should just pray briefly because I'm going to need a ton of help because this is a difficult issue. Lord, I'm just asking, please, that you would help us to see how to talk about the tough issues. Lord, I'm asking that you would help us to have grace for one another and our different opinions about how we even talk about tough issues, let alone the issues themselves. And Lord, I'm asking that you would help me to speak your word, nothing less, nothing more that we would see rightly what you would have for us. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to read this for us. Matthew 22, starting in verse 15. It says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him, that's Jesus, in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? <clears throat> but Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled 
and they left him, and they went away. Should we pay taxes? That's what they're asking him. What if the government is evil? Should we still pay taxes? That was their question. That was what they wanted to trap him in. What about taxes, Jesus? Should we pay them? And Jesus' answer was, you know, you need to give to Caesar what's Caesar's, and then you need to give to God what's God's. And the way he answered that, he fully expected that God's people would do this very thing. And he knew the heart of Caesar, and yet he still said, this is what you do. And he knows all of the governments in the world inside and out because he is king over all of those governments. None of this is a surprise to him. None of this is out of his hands. So in that day, in Jesus' day, Caesar had a couple things. He had the census. Remember Joseph and Mary, the census. And he had taxes. Taxes belonged to Caesar's kingdom. And unfortunately, it seems that nothing has changed over the last 2,000 years, and we still have taxes, darn it. Like, come on. But that's what it is. But for us now, today, our Caesar, our government, still has taxes, still has the census, but they have a couple of things that none of the governments in Jesus' day had. Today, our Caesar, our government, still asks that we pay taxes. Our government still asks that we fill out the census stuff every 10 years. We do that. Our government asks us to serve on jury duty. And our government asks us to vote. That's what Caesar is asking us to do. So in the government that God has put us under, we're asked to give our thoughts, which, what an opportunity. We're asked to take part in communicating to our Caesar how to rule this land, how to govern us. Matthew and Mark and John and Peter and Luke and Paul, they didn't have a blessing like we have. They didn't live under that opportunity. Nonetheless, however, they would be following Jesus' instructions and how we are gonna follow Jesus' instructions. Right here in this text, we are called to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to render unto God what is God's. That's the principle that Jesus taught, and I believe that principle applies to these things as well. Taxes, jury duty, census, voting, same principle. Now, if I stopped there, and this is important, let's not miss this, if I stopped there and said, just do this because Jesus said so, I would be preaching a moralistic law that wouldn't be of any real value. Just grit your teeth and do it. If we're not careful, that might be how we read this passage. That might be how we hear this. We need to stop. As gospel people, we need to ask the question, where is the gospel in this particular text? Because I believe we can find it. It's here. Because this passage is actually part of a bigger event. See, what I did is I took it a little bit out of context. Now I want to show you the whole context and what this fits in. If we take the full context, it starts at verse 15, which we read, but it doesn't end until verse 46. This is a series of events where the various religious leaders of the day are coming to Jesus and they're trying to trap him. And so they ask him a series of three questions. They kind of take turns at trying to trap Jesus. The first question is the one that we read. Should we pay taxes? The second question is, what do you do with a guy who had seven wives in the resurrection? Who's he married to? And the third question we're all pretty familiar with, what is the greatest law? And Jesus gives these great answers, these helpful, amazing answers that first of all, totally blow the the Pharisees and the Sadducees away. And second, it silences them. And these are important answers to important questions, but they're not the most important question because Jesus takes those three questions and he answers them and he's probably like, oh, that's cute. But then he says, now I have a question for you. And we see that in verse 41. Jesus turns this around to them and he says, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? That's the question. And that question and the answer to that question is what actually helps us understand how the gospel applies rightly to the other answers, to this thing that we read. You see, because when we understand who the Christ is, Whose son is he? How does that work? Then we start to discover that when we're saved by the perfect life 
death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, we get a new citizenship. If we didn't have that, we'd just have Caesar. But we have what is Caesar's and what is in the kingdom of God's. We get dual citizenship. We, we suddenly start to realize there's something more. And on this note, we're now citizens of the kingdom of God, except we're asked by our king as we're still traveling through this country on our way to the eternal city, we are asked to be ambassadors of the king and represent him. Which means while we're here, we're gonna render to Caesar as we're asked to do so, and we're gonna render to God what belongs to each of those areas. And we have to come to grips with this reality. We're all kind of selfish. We're all stirring inside but it is by the gracious gospel and the power of Jesus Christ that we are slowly being transformed a little more and a little more and our, our wicked selfishness and our, our junk inside is being transformed little by little so that as we come to the things that Caesar asks of us, we are able to recognize that we can still worship God by serving God even though we're asked to do things of our earthly Caesar today. You can actually make these things an act of service by how you're walking and following with Jesus, serving as his ambassador. So this is an important thing. So why we want to be able to talk about it and walk through it and not just brush it off to the side or keep it outside the walls. It's important. And so maybe this morning, based on what I've said, maybe God is stirring in you a little bit to go, oh, well, I wasn't too interested in that, but maybe now I need to consider it. Maybe I need to think about it. I mean, I know some of you have been thinking about this for a long time. You're already there. But some of you aren't. Right? So we're just going to graciously say we're here to help you. That's what the table is out there for. And there's something you need to know. Maybe that's you. There's something you need to know. Caesar has put a deadline on when you have to be registered to vote. And if you're not registered to vote by October 25th, then you're not going to be able to vote on election day. So if you're feeling like God is stirring you to do this, regardless of what you're going to do in the in the ballot box on the poll, like when you step into the, the poll, you got to think about registering. So outside on that table, there's voter registration cards, there's a bunch of information. If you want to find out a lot more about the election, there's a lot more information out there. There's a bunch of stuff out there. Or you can go to the Nebraska Family Alliance and they'll help you get started. There's a ton of stuff on that website that'll just help you. Because if we're really going to render unto Caesar as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we probably need to figure out how we're going to do that. Or if you're one of those who, who knows how to use these little QR codes, you can go to the QR code in your bulletin and you can get started right there. Because if we're going to do what the Lord has, has asked us to do and be transformed by his gospel, we probably need to do it responsibly and do it well because that's our act of worship to the Lord as we serve in this country as we travel to our kingdom. Amen?